everyone. Welcome to our latest episode of Ask the Expert. We have Dr. Patrick Scott with us today. So thank you for being here. I will just ask you to introduce yourself and kind of give us a little bit of background about yourself first. Sure. Um, my name is Patrick Scott. I am an optometrist. I work here at the Kentucky Lions Eye Center as well as out at the Springs location on Dutchman's Lane. I practice uh, comprehensive uh, primary eye care, and I also am the director of the Contact Lens Clinic, where we see numerous patients uh, that have different types of diseases. Uh, I am a native of Buffalo, New York, where I grew up. I went to Canisius College for undergrad, and then I made my way to Boston. Um, spent about 10 years do there doing my uh, optometry degree, and then a PhD in anatomy and neuroscience. And then I moved to Louisville in 2011, where I've taught uh, medical gross anatomy, dental gross anatomy, uh, have worked in a flourishing research laboratory, uh, but have now taken more of a primary role as a clinician here uh, at U of L. Okay, awesome. So, thank you for joining us. Um, this is probably pretty non-technical stuff that we're going to be talking about compared to what you do every day, but oh, May wonderful. is so May is Healthy Vision Month, and um, just wanted to pick your brains about some tips and easy things that people can do just to try to maintain their eye health. Um, so we know that getting regular eye exams is very important, but kind of, can you tell us the difference between getting just a regular eye exam and a dilated eye exam? And is it important to get the dilated portion of that? Sure. So typically um, I have many patients around the time that the Kentucky State Fair uh, happens because we have the screenings that we do to identify people that are at risk. Um, sometimes they'll have some high pressure or we'll notice that their visual acuity has decreased. Um, and we wanna get those patients in for a complete eye exam. And sometimes the patients think that the screening is actual eye exam. It's, it's not, it's just, we're basically saying, well, you know, there's something that doesn't seem right here. So let's get you in to see one of our docs. So typically when a patient comes in for a complete eye exam, we will assess the ocular health of the eye and the visual system. So we'll look at the area around the eyes. So we do um, looking at the skin to make sure that there's no uh, dermatitis or anything that's unusual that shouldn't be there, such as little basal cell carcinoma or other cancerous growths. And then we look especially at the ocular surface, especially in the uh, Ohio Valley here, because many patients suffer from chronic allergies and uh, they often go untreated. So I like to uh, find those patients that are out there and see if I can give them some relief from their allergies. And then we look at the cornea and the lens. Um, and when we're looking at the lens, we can determine whether the patient has a significant cataract, that uh, there's something that needs to be done about it. We'll then look in the back of the eye and the two uh, major structures that we look at back there are the retina and the optic nerve. Now the retina is what is going to capture light that gets into the eye and is going to allow us to perceive uh, color, detail, and is also responsible for nighttime vision and allowing us to see in the dark. And one of the major structures that we look at that's part of the retina is the macula. And the macula is a highly active uh, part of the retina that can produce a lot of metabolic waste or just build up of waste that can often result um, in what was macular degeneration um, later in life. We like to look at the optic nerve because the optic nerve is a collection of all of the nerve cables that originate from the retina that will go on to communicate with the brain. Assessing the optic nerve is important because different diseases that affect the central nervous system also manifest a patient that has maldis or that has elevated intracranial pressure and may be complaining of headaches. They may have some vision loss that's occurring because the pressure inside of the head is pushing on the optic nerve. Um, glaucoma is another disease that 
we worry about too, because patients' uh, pressure inside of their eye, whether it's low, high, or within the normal range, can often be too much for the patient's eye to tolerate. And what can happen is if that pressure is too much for the eye, the, um, the nerves that are part of the optic nerve will begin to die off and it's a slow progressive disease, whereas the patient typically doesn't know that they're losing their vision until it's quite advanced. So we can't always see everything we need to in a patient that refuses to have a dilated eye exam. So we like to dilate, I like to use this analogy. Um, it's basically a non-dilated eye exam. I can see about five to 10% of what I need to. And I make the analogy of, would you rather me look through a keyhole of a door to tell you what's in the room, or would you rather me open the door and look around and give you a complete answer of my assessment of what's in there? So that's where the dilation comes in. And that's basically where you're getting the drops that the doctor or the technician's giving you to open up your pupil to allow us to have better access and, and sight to see within the eye itself to look for anything that may be hiding out in the periphery of the eye, such as little nevi, retinal detachments, holes, and things like that. So um, what's also important too is that diabetes is sneaking up on us as quite a, you know, a public health problem. So a dilated eye exam is very important for patients that are suspected of having diabetes. Many patients won't even know that they're diabetic and usually um, they'll come into the office here um, for their eye care and we will often be the first to diagnose and say, hey, you, you, you know, you, you've got signs of diabetes. You may want to uh, follow up with your primary care doc because diabetes can become a blinding condition if left unchecked. So very important, and it's a big difference between a dilated and an undilated exam. So we recommend that you have a dilated eye exam on a yearly basis as the standard of care okay. for everybody. Okay. All right. So a dilated eye exam every year. Um, so other than these routine exams, um, are there any other steps that people can take to help either maintain their eye health or... Um, just ensure that it continues. Um, I know some, uh, we've talked to a couple of doctors before in previous interviews, and they've always mentioned, you know, just your standard overall health, you know, eating healthy, exercising, not smoking, that kind of thing. But is there anything else, or do you want to emphasize any of those that are most important? Just other steps. A healthy diet, yeah, a healthy diet is, is obviously number one. Um, some patients have asked whether or not they should be taking a, a multivitamin, and that's fine, but when, when patients sometimes take uh, vitamins in isolation, say they'll take a lot of vitamin E or vitamin A, uh, that may have um, an effect, an adverse effect that we're not exactly looking for because everybody's genes are a little bit different. And now we're finding out that what's good for one person may not be good for another and could affect your um, ocular health. My, um, what I recommend most of all in the summertime, especially even when you're going outside, is to have ultraviolet uh, blockers. So UV blockers are very important because they prevent ultraviolet light from damaging the skin around the eye. So most people don't think of that, but that's one of the major reasons that we're wearing sunglasses is to protect the skin. And then second, the uh, UV blockers will help absorb some of the ultraviolet light from getting into the eye itself. And ultraviolet light, if allowed to get into the eye, can cause cataract, it can cause damage to the macula. So you can have cataract formation, macular degeneration. So anytime you're outside, you really should have a pair of um, UV sunglasses on. Okay. This kind of leads into my next question. So we, we know it's important to protect our eyes with um, you know, either goggles or safety glasses or sunglasses, depending on the situation. Um, but are there any other tips or recommendations that you can give on best ways to protect your eyes from um, just any type of element, especially with a lot of people working on computers these days? Is there any specific um, workplace things that people should be doing? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So first, 
first and foremost is kids and any patient that really has only one good eye should be in polycarbonate lenses. And those are basically lenses that are ANSI, they've been uh, certified by ANSI standards, meaning that if you have glass or plastic and a projectile, the, the glasses were to take an impact, they can shatter. Polycarbonate is the least likely to do that. So it's going to protect the eye and the surface of the eye, uh, most of all. Second, um, kids, and anybody basically up uh, and through their 50s should think about using uh, a blue light filter uh, on their glasses because what's coming off of all of these smart devices, so these computers, uh, LED lights, fluorescent bulbs, things like that is high energy visible light. Now that's light that we see, but it's, it's good for you, um, but there's a different wavelength spectrum of this blue light that's not good for you. So blue light in general helps to train our circadian or our sleep wake cycle but a specific wavelength that's being emitted by these smart devices, um, it gets uh, into the eye and it can be highly unstable. And it's similar, it can have a similar effect of ultraviolet light on the back of the eye, the macula, because we're finding now in several animal studies that it can be toxic to the macula. And it's really kids uh, are at highest risk or adults that are using computers for prolonged periods of time that are being exposed to this light. Um, because they have not developed any yellowing of the lens inside of their eye. And a cataract actually prevents against the absorption of this high energy light in the back of the eye. So uh, pretty much if you're gonna be on a computer for a prolonged period, you wanna consider a blue light filter in the specs. And I recommend it for basically all children that are wearing glasses. Okay. Thank you. So as with a lot of health issues, there are a lot of things that we can help do to prevent them, but some diseases and conditions kind of run in families. So are there any certain eye diseases or conditions that we should all talk to our family about that could potentially just be passed down and something that we can't really control? Sure, macular degeneration, um, there is a genetic link with that. So if you have parents, grandparents that have had um, that disease, it's important to tell your doctor or physician um, glaucoma, especially if you have a sibling that has had or has the disease because it's a higher association with a brother or sister. Um, other things like cataract, which is a natural progression of aging. I know a lot of patients will report that they had family members with that. Uh, not overly concerned about that because it is a natural process of aging. But the big two are essentially um, it, glaucoma and then macular degeneration. And then there's also um, for patients that are very nearsighted that have had brothers and sisters, parents that have a really, that they've always worn glasses that are a very high prescription um, or could be at risk for a retinal detachment. Um, so we wanna make sure that we document that. And then there's many different um, diseases that can be passed down, but those tend to be more obscure. So um, we deal with those when we can. All right. Well, I appreciate you being on here with us today. Um, just kind of to wrap up, do you have anything else that you want to add just to, um, you know, best practices to make sure you remember to go to the doctor or anything, anything you want to add before we... Yeah, I would say always wash your hands anytime you're going to touch your eye. Do not rub your eyes, even though they feel like they're going to itch because rubbing the eye can actually make it worse. You could have sand or other particles in there that you could be scratching your cornea with. Um, if your eyes bother you at any time, you should have them assessed. Do not use any type of pond water or anything like that um, because there are microbes in there that love to get on the surface of the eye um, and make a home and can cause problems. Otherwise, wear sunglasses as often as you can outside. Get a blue light filter on your glasses if you're a person that's on the computer and just be checked out once a year for a fully dilated eye exam and when in doubt we'll check it out okay well i have one last question that i just thought of when you were talking about rubbing the eyes we were just at churchill downs um, a few days ago doing some screenings for people that worked on the backside, mm -hmm. and a lot of them work in the stables with horses and I think allergies is a lot of the problem, but they were all complaining of itchy eyes. Is there anything 
uh, you can do kind of as a home remedy is, you know, can they use simple baby shampoo or anything to kind of help clean the eyes? Do you have any recommendations there? So if it's, if it's itching that they're experiencing, um, there's several over-the-counter medications that are available. There's one that I recommend because it's just easy to remember. It's Zadator. And all you have to remember is the letter Z because it's the only drop that starts with the letter Z. Um, so you take it twice a day. And that helps to uh, target some of the allergy on the surface of the eye. And then an ice pack on the eyelids themselves for twice a day for about 10 minutes. It's basically doing the same thing as the antihistamine. So the ice will help to get rid of some of the swelling and allow the blood vessels to kind of tighten up so that they're not releasing all kinds of fluid into the area around the eye. Heat's actually probably the worst thing you wanna put on there because heat's gonna increase blood flow and that increases inflammation. So three things I recommend for that are the Zadator twice a day, an ice pack 10 minutes twice a day, uh, and then artificial tears about four times a day, one drop both eyes to just keep the uh, surface tears just flowing to remove any type of those allergens that make their way uh, onto the surface of the eye. Okay. All right, perfect. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much for being with us today. We will let you get back to your day, but thank you again. All right, absolutely, later. anytime, thank you. All right, bye Dr. Scott. Bye-bye.